we've been studying in this class on uh, the tabernacle biography is what I like to call this. And the reason is that biographies include more than just the initial subject. They include, if you're talking about someone, you're talking about influences from people from inside their lives and outside of their lives, the, the uh, effects and the problems that occur. And that's why we're going to do that with our tabernacle biography this morning. Our biography is actually comes, begins in Exodus. It's the narration of the Hebrew nation. It originates in the book of Exodus, and it's probably the best and only, if I can get this changed, there it is, the best and only complete source of these events. There's a little hint of it to Abraham, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but right now we're going to focus in Exodus. The reason why this is a narration of the Hebrews, the Hebrews couldn't have had the tabernacle if they had not gone through the things that they did at the beginning. So we're going to look at one of the reasons, the main reason why they left Egypt was because of the oppression uh, of the Hebrews by the Pharaoh. The phenomenal Hebrew growth in the Hebrew population troubles the Pharaoh Sesostris. And Sesostris uh, got worried about all these new Hebrews that were coming along. They were, they were multiplying like rabbits almost. And uh, he said, wait a minute, what's happening out there in Goshen where they were living? And all it was was a completion, or a, a, at least a part of a completion, that God gave to Abraham when he said, your seed will number as the stars in the sky and as the sands along the shore. So this was what God was instigating and Pharaoh didn't understand. So he orders the killing of the male Hebrew babies. At first he ordered all babies, but then the uh, mothers in, in Goshen weren't following up on this. They weren't going to kill them. So he makes another order that's explicit to the Hebrew children. Of course, we know the story of Moses pretty well, that he, he was targeted, and his mother put him, put him in a little basket that was covered, and he put him in the river, and he hid it in the brushes. And he was found by, who else, but Sestosaurus' daughter. So this began, she adopts the child. She rescues him and adopts him and brings him into the palace. So here we have now a Hebrew who was supposed to have been killed that is now in the palace with Pharaoh. So Moses stays there and he learns the ways of the Egyptians as well as his own family in Hebrews. His mother was still educating him. And he learns that he's both a Hebrew and kind of an Egyptian by adoption. And he goes now through all the training that they had. He was trained militarily. Some scholars that I've read have talked about how he was a pretty good general for Egypt in some of their battles. So he's learning to lead people, whether he realized it or not. Another peculiar way that God works to teach people and put them in his service. So Moses is there for 40 years. He's 40 years old, and he sees a, an Egyptian beating up on a slave, and he looks around and doesn't see anybody, so he kills him, kills the Egyptian. And he buries him, hides him in the sand, thinking he's going to get away with it, that nobody knew, nobody saw. The next day, a couple of guys got into a fight. Moses comes in to try to break it up, and they ask him, you going to kill us like you did that Egyptian? Well, of course, Moses realizes that this is not going to be a secret, that when Pharaoh finds out, he's going to come after him. So Moses flees into the desert, and he gets into the desert, and there he establishes his, his new life, if you would. He gets married. He has a family. Uh, he, he becomes a shepherd out there, and uh, very humble from the part that he had played at the palace of Pharaoh. So after 40 years, God calls him through his, that picture is a burning bush, and God calls him to go deliver his people. Of course, Moses uh, tries to get out of it, to be honest about it. He, well, are you sure you got the right guy, Lord? And, you know, I stutter and tried like we would do probably give all the excuses in the book that he possibly could. 
But instead, God says, no, you're going to go. You're going to be my ambassador. You're going to be going to Pharaoh. So Moses goes, as God commands, to Pharaoh. And he politely asks for three days. Let me take the people out into the desert for three days, Lord. And I'll take my people out there. We will sacrifice to our God, and he won't be angry with us, and he will bless us. Well, what would you expect him to say? Pharaoh said, no, no way are you going to do that. In fact, you've made me mad, and now, instead of making bricks with straw we bring you, you're going to make bricks on your own. You're going to have to furnish the straw. Well, that didn't suit very much with the people of Israel, the Hebrews. They, they got mad at Moses, and his, they turned away from him. And at this point, I think it was probably one of the lowest, if not the lowest points in um, Moses' life. Because here he's going to do what God says, and, and he's got no cooperation from Egypt and none from his people. But God says, go back, do it again. This time, you're not going to be polite. This time, you're going to demand. So he goes back, and he demands that Pharaoh let them people go. And this time, he says, no, still not going to do it. And the results of that are the ten plagues that we're all familiar with from even little kids in Sunday school can almost tell you all ten of the, uh, the uh, plagues. So Hebrews 12, 30 to 36 then talks about the released folks in uh, the Hebrews because after those plagues, after he lost his firstborn and all those in Egypt that did not have the blood around the doorposts and on the lintels, they uh, lost their firstborn. And you can imagine a whole nation losing your firstborn child. Uh, unfortunately, that would have been me if I'd have been living at that time and had no blood on the doorpost. So I was the firstborn in my family. And the cry that came out of Egypt is probably unreal to think about. So Pharaoh says, go, please, get out of here, leave. Uh, we don't want you here. Go take whatever you need. We'll give it to you. And people were actually coming out in the streets and handing their jewelry over to the Hebrews just to get rid of them. Said, please leave us, will you? We well, you think that's a strange plan, except for one thing. This was kind of revealed, I mentioned earlier, just in a passing, to Abraham back in Genesis 15, verses 13 through 18, where God tells Abraham in a dream that your seed, those that you uh, that, that are going to follow you, will spend 400 years of affliction. That's verse 13. Verse 14 says that God will judge the afflicting nation. And we see this happen, of course, in the Exodus portion. And it happens within four generations. They were in captivity for 400 years, but it was four generations after Abraham that they first went down to Egypt. Then he has a vision of the smoking furnace and a burning lamp. And I believe that this was kind of the vision of the, the burning bush first and then the pillar of fire that would lead them as well. It all ties together that way. And he records the promised land's boundaries to Abraham. He said, here's where your descendants will settle, what we call now the promised land. It was from Egypt all the way up to uh, almost to uh, what we call Turkey now, or Asia, up in that area. So they were having to get there, and their journey will begin, of course, in Egypt, It'll go through the Red Sea to Mount Sinai, across the wilderness, and finally crossing the Jordan into the Promised Land and the land of milk and honey. But before they could advance or even construct the uh, tabernacle, Israel first had to reach Mount Sinai for God's instructions. Those instructions were going to include the moral aspect, the physical aspect, the religious aspect, and the military aspect. Moses was going to train them all to be an army. He's going to train them all to be moral after they'd been influenced for 400 years out of the Egyptians' uh, influence. God says, we're going, to, we're going to give you new rules, guys, to go by. So the journey 
begins this way, and we'll look at Exodus 13, 17, and 18. And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that God didn't lead them by the land of the Philistines, although the more direct route, which was the direct route, excuse me, to Canaan. And it's, it's only, uh, I think it's like 250 miles. I don't remember the exact number right now. But I do remember that they could have got there in about 12 to 14 days if they'd have gone up through the Philistines. But God knew they weren't ready to tackle the Philistines at that point. For God said, lest the people, perhaps the people rather, change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. He knew that they weren't ready for a battle, that Moses was going to have to take time to train them as soldiers. They'd been slaves, not soldiers. So Moses had his work cut out for him just to do that. And that was for all the men that were over 20 years old would be able to be a soldier. And uh, one more part of that. So God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. And the children of Israel went up in orderly ranks out of the land of Egypt. So he didn't go the straight way. He knew that they weren't ready to fight the Philistines, but he could train them a little bit as he went with smaller little kingdoms and, uh, uh, of people. The, there were the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, all kinds of ites that were out there in that territory. And he could take them on a little at a time and train them and get them experience in battle before they tackled the mighty Philistines. Many occasions, as we look through this journey that we're seeing here in the Exodus, in many occasions, the archaeological uh, information used to help confirm biblical places and events doesn't always line up. The location of cities and of relics and scrolls that they use for, for uh, saying this is when such and such happened uh, doesn't always fit, but in many times it clears things up for us at the same time. The latest archaeological evidence of the Exodus crossing of the Red Sea is the journey that we're going to look at in just a moment. If you look there at the map, if you can see that at home, I hope you can, you'll see where instead of going down the southern, the, or the western half of the Sinai Peninsula down to the point down there of that uh, peninsula, instead they crossed a little bit higher and crossed the ocean at the Gulf of Aqaba. And we'll give that a really close look in just a second. Because of this, you'll see in your maps, in your Bibles, most maps are this one that you'll see, where they go down that west side, down to Sinai, and then come back up. But they've crossed the Red Sea way up there where, I don't know if it says number one or not. I can't see if it's that big or not. But that first black dot, you see up there is where they crossed. They call that the Sea of, Reed, or the sea of Reeds, rather. And that sea is a very shallow sea right there. It's in the kind of the uh, run water, run off of the Sinai, uh, the Gulf of Sinai, rather. And uh, it, I just, let me back up here. It's in the Gulf of the Suez that that runs off into, and it's a very shallow area. So the thing that was, the question was asked was, uh, when most maps have the problem here, we'll go on to that one. Where the problem was, was they said, well, they had to cross at a low tide so they could wade across the, the, the sea, if you would. It's the Sea of Reeds, but not, not really the Red Sea yet. But if they did that, then that kind of contradicts the scripture where it says they walked through on dry land. They would have to be wading there in shallow water. And also... There's a problem with the fact that the Egyptian army was drowned by the, water, the incoming water that Moses had parted. And if it was shallow sea, there wasn't enough water there to drown the Egyptians. So low tide. Now, let me go back here to, excuse me, the Mount Sinai location. That's another problem. You'll notice it's down at the bottom of that map, down right at the, almost the point of the Sinai Peninsula. How did it get there? How did they decide that? Well, it turns out that uh, uh, 
there was a Constantine's mother claimed to be a psychic, and she went down through the promised land, finding all these relics and places, uh, the, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the birthplace of Jesus, they found it. And she said, this is where it is, this is where it is, Mount Sinai is right here, and he was the emperor, so Mount Sinai is right there. So they put it at that bottom part of, your, of that map. The problem with that is that the Bible itself, if you look in Galatians 4.25, says that Mount Sinai was not in the Sinai Peninsula, but it was in Saudi Arabia on the other side of the Gulf of Aqaba. So we see where archaeological is coming into effect with changing some of the things that we traditionally have looked at. Now, granted, it's somewhat controversial, and some people say, no, that's not good. Uh, but others will say, yeah, that makes sense to me. So I will leave that up to you. And as you can see here, this is that map a little bit closer. Uh, the latest claim for the actual route to Exodus will be coming from divers, believe it or not. They took diving and went down into the Sea of Aqaba, and that's where they found some of those things. So they were, uh, well, here it is, the latest claim of the actual Exodus route came from divers finding coral-encrusted bones and chariot remains in the Gulf of Aqaba. I brought some pictures today that we'll go through and take a look at, but they came across at this Nueba crossing. Now this is uh, from a, an, an archeologist named Ron Wyatt, and Ron Wyatt came in the late 70s through this area and was looking for things like the ark and all different uh, Bible stories, and he was trying to back them up archaeologically. And this was the one that was, was a hit for him, at least for him. Where they left Goshen, you can see up at the top, uh, the, at the Egyptian Delta from Succoth, and they crossed the wilderness of the Red Sea from west to east, and that was still considered Egyptian territory, though not Egypt, Egypt itself. They crossed out of the wilderness into the Midian, which is actually Saudi Arabia. If you look down in the corner, or right lower corner, you'll see Midian. And that's where Moses, if you remember, that's where he fled to. So he was familiar with this area. Aqaba is considered part of the Red Sea in biblical times. And that's the Nueba crossing, right in about the center of that Gulf of Aqaba. They spent seven days and seven nights crossing the wilderness of the Red Sea, a distance of about 200 miles from the, where they started to where they finally ended up across the sea. Where are the Philistines originally from? I have a question came up. Uh, I wish I could answer that. I, I, they are, I know they were on the east or on the west coast of, the, of Palestine, but that's as far as I know that where they came from. So I will try to look that up though and see if I can get a better answer for you next week at the class. So there they are, cross that, and you say, How could, could they really do that? Well, Moshe Diane did it in 1967 in the Six Day War. He actually crossed in reverse of what the Israelites did, but he, he went and whipped Egypt at that point, and they finally settled in a, in a peace agreement that left that give that land back to Egypt, but he had actually conquered it in six days going across that peninsula. So almost the same identical route that the Exodus took. So here they are. They came down through this Wadi Watir, I hope that's the way you pronounce it. I'm not sure it's, but, <coughs> excuse me. And they came down through this Wadi Watur, and it's an opening in a mountain passage where a river had cut through, and it gave them a means to get there. Exodus 14.3 says they are entangled in the land. The wilderness hath shut them in. And if you look at that, if, that's, if they're in that little stream there, we'll run it back here, 
you can see that there's not a lot of maneuvering room, especially for three million people coming down through there. There's no room to back up or turn around. All they could do is keep going forward. And in the meantime, they're looking behind them and saying, hey, you know, this is not good because I think the Egypts are coming. The Egyptians are coming. Well, this is a satellite view of, that, of where that ends up, and it ends up at uh, um, uh, Nuiba. There we go. It couldn't work. It was gone there for a minute. And this is the beach at Nuiba. And this Wadi Watur, is it the root of the Exodus? We don't know, but it looks good. And here's a look from the other end going toward there. You can see that crooked path that they would have to follow. And they end up coming out at Pi, Pi, uh, Pi Hahirath. That's the way I, th I hope that's pronounced right, too. And they come out there. At, it's uh, after about 18 miles through the wilderness. They come out at that place, and they end up at the Gulf of Aqaba. Here's a little better picture of that opening as they come out facing the Red Sea, which was the Gulf of Aqaba for them. And there's the Pi Haya. Is that right? Hahirath? I'll let you decide. So it's close enough, I guess. They were, this was where they came through to that sea, and op it opened up a passage for them. Again, another satellite picture. You can see in the green where they followed that uh, Wadi Watur down to the beach itself. When they got to the beach, they realized that there's a Roman garrison that's up here at Gildal, and also down at the south, they can't go anywhere because there's mountains. So they are really realizing that they're trapped. They're only 10 miles across the sea to, um, to Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is, only, you know, is their escape, if you can. But how do you get there? On a clear day, you can see it. Can you imagine? Here you are. You got, you're, you're trapped, and you can see your escape, but you can't get to it. So what do they do? Of course, you know, they... Uh, <laughs> they get scared. They start panicking. And here's, they're trapped, and it said the Egyptians were behind them. The fortress was to the north of them, which is to the right of your screen. The mountains to the south, they can't go there. And what's to the east? An ocean. They are trapped. And the people begin to murmur and Moses, why did you bring us out here what, to, to die in the wilderness here? They've already been fed. They've already been watered in the de desert, but that doesn't seem to soak in much. And they're saying, you know, you know, we're just out here to die. That kind of brings us back to where God says, this is why I'm taking you the long way around, because of your lack of faith. That's what kept them out of the promised land. So now what? Well, the children of Israel, of course, can see their escape 10 miles away and they murmur and Exodus 14 13 says Moses said to the people do not be afraid stand still and see the salvation of the Lord which he will accomplish for you this day today there's more to it for the Egyptians who you see today you shall see again no more forever. For some reason, that, when I read that, it, it almost gave me chills because of the way he said it. it. You will see them no more again forever. You know, this, if, if I were a Hebrew, that would scare me bad worse than what the Egyptians were doing at that particular point. Because God is saying, I'll handle this. You watch. See what happens. So what happened? Moses, of course... Uh, parts the water. Well, Moses didn't part the water. God divided the sea, Exodus 14, 21 to 29. And he's, here it says uh, at the bottom here, he stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong eastern wind all that night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided, and the ground, uh, and excuse me, the waters were divided, and the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon dry land. And the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. That doesn't sound like the Sea of Reeds. That sounds a little bit deeper than the Sea of Reeds. 
Well, you see where that little path is? There was what they, at least uh, some of the archaeologists claim, that there was a land bridge, so to speak, right in there. On each side of this particular bridge you see on the right there, uh, the gulf is almost a mile deep on both sides. But on this little land bridge is only 2,600 feet, half the distance of those two uh, deep areas. So God says, uh, uh, or God didn't say, oh, Moses said, this is the way we'll go across because it's a, about a quarter to a half mile wide and it's on a natural gradual slope down to the bottom of that Red Sea and then up to the Saudi beach. The deepest point is about 2,600 feet, which is half of, almost just half of a mile. And it's got a slope of about six, uh, three to six degrees, depending on where you're at, going down and coming back up. And you can walk that pretty easily. Even, you know, even those that were older could still climb that, that small grate. And it's the only time, oops, excuse me, I'm got ahead of myself here. The artifacts that were found there is what we're gonna look at in just a moment for our evidences. And I see how I'm running on time here. So the Gulf of Aqaba is where we're looking now. This is where that Red Sea parts around the Sinai Peninsula. The Gulf of Aqaba is on the east side. And this was where we're looking at this point, at that Gulf. The repeated dives of these frogmen, if you want to call them that, these scuba divers that they sent down was anywhere ranging from 60 to 200 feet down and a stretch of two and a half miles, about two and a half miles, that they went over as they were looking and they found, guess what? Chariot parts scattered on the bed of the sea. Lots and lots of chariot parts, not just one or two, but something that should remind them that there was a larger thing than just a couple of hunting parties going across. The artifacts found include wheels, chariot bodies, as well as human and horse bones. And if you remember, when the seas closed up, it took the chariots, it took the Egyptian soldiers, and it took their horses as well. They all drowned because they were to be seen no more, as God said. Here's some of the evidences. This is a picture of an Egyptian chariot wheel, maybe two of them. Uh, and you see, if you can see that, it, it looks a little blurry, but it's because sand is covering up part of it. They were four, six, and eight spoked wheels found. And when I always saw the chariots of, you know, in the movies and all, they only had like four spokes, usually just in, in a cross almost. But this is the only time, according to history, that all three types of spokes were used and coincides with the Exodus period in that realm. All three were used, and they found evidences of all three there in this, on this land bridge. Again, another chariot wheel, a little closer look at it. They were, were made out of wood and then covered in gold. And that would defend, or not defend, would defeat the sands of the desert that they had to go through. It would, it would wear away the gold and not the wood. It wouldn't take too long before a couple sandstorms and you wouldn't have any chariot wheels left. So they took and wrapped it with gold veneer and uh, helped it to survive. And they see that at the bottom there. This is a, also an Egyptian chariot wheel, an axle encased in coral. You can see on the left side, this was the coral, and you can see where they superimposed the, uh, the axle so you could see what it was actually like. And that uh, was a six-spoke wheel on that one. Uh, okay, thank you, Mike. Uh, Mike Nichols just sent us a, a... I've got a little question and answer thing over here that's going off, and Mike Nichols sent us a, a thing that it's amazing information. It was to me, too, Mike. I uh, have to be honest about it. Uh, I've, I've enjoyed this study probably more than you guys have. So, uh, Here's one more evidence, or one or two more that we've got to look at. This, again, is more of the uh, chariot wheels and axles. The one down on the lower right corner, they took a metal detector to that one without chipping away any of the coral, 
and it showed up as positive for iron. So we had iron in the axles, we had wood on the, uh, covered in gold on the wheels, and it's there for people to see. So it kind of changes our outlook on somewhat on the, on the Exodus, and also gives us some tangible things to look at that says, hey, you know, this really happened. This wasn't a made up story someplace in a nursery rhyme. So um, we're getting close here. There, one more, I think, that's really important. And that's the human. This is a human bone there with coral encrusted on one, one of them, and the other one they've chipped away the coral to show you that it's actually a bone. It looks like a hip bone. It may not, you know, but it's a ball and socket. could be a shoulder bone. But the point is, it's a human bone, along with the horse bones that they found and all the other evidences there. One more evidence that um, when Ron Wyatt visited Nuiba in 1978, he found a Phoenician column lying in the water there at Nuiba. But unfortunately, all the inscriptions had worn off and eroded because of the sea and the wind and, and the, the elements. And they'd been eroded away, but un so unfortunately he couldn't get anything out there, and so the column wasn't really important at that point. It was just a column. It looked like many others that were, might have been there in that, at that time. But unfortunately, the inscriptions that had been eroded away didn't tell them anything, so they didn't figure out anything until 1984, because in 1984, a second column was found. And that second column contained the words uh, Mizraim, which was a, another name for Egypt, it had Solomon, Edom, Death, Pharaoh, Moses, Yahweh, all in, indicating that King Solomon had set up these columns as a memorial to the miracle of the crossing of the sea. So he had one on each side at Nuweba and one over on Saudi Arabia. The one on Saudi Arabia still had the engravings on it. But now, unfortunately, Saudi Arabia no longer admits tourists into the area. And they also have taken it down. They removed the column and replaced it with a flag, a marker where it once stood, which to me was very, very interesting that that would be the part. Well, why? I, I can't tell you. Maybe they were afraid of unauthorized Visitors, uh, it's also a, a Muslim area, very strong Muslim area. They may not have wanted anything to do with the Exodus and uh, the Jews. I'm not, I don't have a reason. But I do know that that's a fact and that's what happened. So I hope that you've enjoyed this lesson. We will uh, be uh, temporarily putting you on a hold until our worship service starts at 1030. And I thank you for your attention and your kindness. I hope that you stay well. And for those of our congregation, we miss you here. It's strange to be talking to empty pews, but uh, we know that you're there and we're doing like the First Testament church. We're meeting in the homes. So thank you very much. God bless. Stay well.